very packed morning here uh, on the main stage of uh, the Italian Tech Week. Please take your seat. Ooh, I see a huge crowd with no seats. Uh, yeah, you'll find a seat. Uh, but of course, uh, this is one of the best moments uh, of this conference this year. We have a big uh, speaker coming up. Uh, and like someone used to say, uh, really, my next guest need no introduction. Uh, I was thinking about this chat earlier today, and maybe the, the most common trait, the most common uh, line here is that both speakers have the goal of trying to build something th that lasts, uh, the will to uh, develop ideas, uh, build companies, build companies that then can work for decades to come. So please welcome on the Italian Tech Week main stage, uh, Brian Keski and John Elkan. Thank you. Welcome, 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 Brian. Happy to Thank have you. you here in, in Italy. I know how, how you love Italy. Oh, yes. And, and, and how big is it um, as a market for Airbnb? It's one of our top 10 markets, so yeah, it's a very I big know, market. I know, I <laughs> know. And so very happy to have you in Torino. And welcome, John. The floor is yours. Grazie. Grazie a tutti. It's, thank um, you, thank you, everybody. Very special that you're here, Brian. It's special because you come from Italy. It's special because it took more than a decade to convince <laughs> you to be here. And uh, it's, it's really good that we have uh, an incredible audience. Just to give you an idea, we doubled. Last year, 6,000 people came to Italian Tech Week. This year, we're now at 13,000. 13,000. Yeah. Wow, it's amazing. This is a giant audience, by the way. <laughs> this is a beautiful space, by the way. This is unbelievable. This is so cool. Well, yeah, and, and, and you mentioned, um, a lot of people don't know, my, um, my mom's family is from uh, Catanzaro, which is, uh, you would know better than me, but in Calabria. I've never been there, though. But my grandfather came to the United States when he was two years old. Um, so he was obviously Italian, came to Ellis Island. I think he was born in 1923, so this would have been a 100-year-old birthday. He was an engineer. He was an electrical engineer, but he was also a violinist. And I, I, I really like him because I think my grandfather, an Italian who had this deep connection to music and arts, and also was an engineer. And I think that's you know kind of what I've always aspired for our company to be, this intersection of the technology and the creative side. And I think that if you look at Italy uh, for its history, but also for its present and its future, um, your, your grandfather is, is a very good example about the, versatili the versatility and the capabilities that we have in Italy, where you have incredible technical skills, but also a very important side that looks at all the humanities and Leonardo is considered this very larger than, than, than life figure in, in the ways he was able to not only invent no. uh, and was a very capable engineer, but also an incredible painter, an incredible, um, an incredible man in combining uh, not only technical knowledge, but also creative knowledge. And I think that what, what over the years we've found here and, and, and why this event is important, and also what we're doing directly in Italy uh, from very early startups that, that are here and present to, to our uh, larger activity, is, is seeing how we can, as, as Italians, be able to have more confidence if we have technical backgrounds. And I personally, I, I'm an engineer. I, I came to Italy after growing up in, in many countries to study here in Turin engineering and really have, have the courage of using that technical capabilities to be more inventive. And, and, and equally, you, you find very strong uh, entrepreneurs in Italy, but they don't necessarily have the technical knowledge. And, and sometimes, because they don't have the technical knowledge, they tend not to try and create mm. and build something that 
doesn't exist or that they would dream of. And you, you are among the very few, if not the, the only uh, tech leader of a very large company now that is not a technologist at core. And so how, how as Italians, can we, can we reflect on this from your experience? And what, what advice do you, do you have for us? It's a great question. Um, Italy, as you all know, has one of the great histories of creation in humankind. And all you have to do is walk around Italy. To, uh, last month, I was in Venice, and I was marveling about what it must have felt like 600 years ago. I mean, there are a few countries in the world that have a greater culture of innovation, of art and science combined together. Um, but let's talk very specifically about your question. You know, when I came to Silicon Valley, um, what well, maybe my background, I went to the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD. It's a design school. And when I went to RISD, I wanted to be an industrial designer. And I never thought about running a tech company. But in the 2000s, it was the golden age of the Apple renaissance, another renaissance. And it was a renaissance not just of technology, but it was a renaissance of design. And I remember that the core theory was that technology alone was not enough and that you didn't start with the technology and say, we have this technology. What can we do with this technology? Let's work towards the customer. That what a designer would often do is you'd start with a customer. You start with a problem and you work backwards to the technology. And what we have in Silicon Valley are a lot of technologists who invent incredibly important technologies. And, so they're in, in, and if you're inventing a technology, you're very inclined to then say, well, what can we do with this? Well, you want people that come from the other point of view, that they have a lot of history of working with engineers, working with software engineers, electrical engineers, uh, mechanical engineers, but they understand here are the problems that we're trying to solve. What is like, and I think about the great brands, like obviously you have uh, one of the brands that you preside over is Ferrari. That brand is more than just a technological feat. It is a technological feat, but it also represents emotion. And people aren't usually buying technology. People are buying products. Maybe even more than products, they buy ideas. And those ideas are wrapped with technology, which is how you make something, the design, what it actually is, how it's assembled, and the story and the brand that's wrapped around it. And I think that that is just as important as the technology. The marriage of the technology and creativity, the liberal arts, is going to be critical. And so what we need probably more in Silicon Valley is what probably people here have in Italy, that you have much of that history, the heritage, that culture, that intuition, that imagination that is probably in the DNA of this culture. And also remember that many of the great scientists played musical instruments like Einstein. And so I think that that divergent thinking is so critical. So I think Italians, we should see ourselves as a critical ingredient for innovation. And without that ingredient, we become very like empirically based, iterative, and we just start making smaller and smaller leaps. I feel that what, what is really interesting, uh, going, going back to Ferrari, is that Ferrari is, is at the core uh, company that wants to build the fastest cars. And it yeah. comes from its racing, uh, racing roots. And if you are always pushed in trying to be able to do the fastest car, uh, that definitely uh, drives you, and it's very much technically yes. uh, driven. On the other hand, as, as also Ferrari ended up doing sports cars to fund the mm. racing activity, it also needed to make cars that were compelling. And, and that's where a lot of the aesthetics, a lot of the beauty, beauty that the cars have came into, came into motion. And the aesthetic side and, and the beauty that we have in Italy has also been a, an important feature in, in design. And you have really the combination of the functionality of what new objects have come up to be with, with also the beauty in which they were done. And, and that dialogue, that continuous ping pong between uh, the engineers, the creators, has definitely been a, a big part 
of, of what we have been able to produce and what we're very proud at. And if, if I look at some of our experiences, Brian, for example, when we came to the United States uh, with Chrysler and the Jeep brand and the products that we ended up being able to do uh, out of Jeep came from that uh, marriage of, of how we were looking not only at the technical capabilities, and, and Jeep in its case has very strong technical capabilities in, in the outdoors space and the off-road side, but also how it was in terms of its aesthetics, in terms of what it represents. Now, one of the things that I've been really puzzling with, and, and I think also us as a country and a culture, is we are very physical. Mm. And so as we imagine how to apply creativity, how to apply beauty, how to apply all of these attributes we have with also our understanding of technology <coughs> within a software environment, with, within a more virtual environment. Mm. Uh, w you've been doing that, and, yeah. and I've always enjoyed our conversations over the years where you, you come from a very clear design background and me coming from an engineering one, but we live in in, in two worlds, one of hardware in my end and one of software in, in yours. And, and I think that's, that's definitely something which is interesting to, to see how you think about it. And also, if you were to do something within, within the hardware space, um, and let's say if you were to imagine doing something here in Italy, what that <laughs> could be. You bring up so many, so many thoughts. So the digital world that we can create with pixels is special, but there are some problems with it. We're in this amazing building right now. This building was designed by an architect, presumably, and architecture has a multi-thousand-year-old history. People go to school for it, and architects think really holistically about how they design the buildings. They you know, really understand how people feel. There's a permanence to architecture. There's a sense that the person who's building the building, that that space will be around long after they're gone. When we make software, in fact, in the early 90s, when the internet was emerging, there really weren't a lot of creative people or designers involved in the internet. You had like web designers, but the problem is many of the best designers stayed in the physical world. They were doing what we might call print design or they were doing like analog design and they stayed in the physical realm. So then you had this digital realm that was designed and they had engineers and the engineers realized they needed assistance to build these products and designers came in, but they weren't exactly like architects. They had a maybe smaller remit. And so in that void, a new function emerged that doesn't exist in the same kind of way in architecture, which is the product manager. And that role is a critical role. But what sometimes happened was that many of the creative functions became subordinate to the product engineering and business functions. And we really feel like creative functions and technology functions should be like your left leg and your right leg. If one leg is longer than the other, you're not going to be able to move as quickly. And so what I think is really important is we are the dawn of a new era. Just like the internet in the 90s, we have a new era with AI. It's a whole new platform shift. We have an opportunity. AI, I think we should think of as the most powerful tool that we've ever put in our hands. And what can we do with this tool? It's like the ultimate paintbrush. And we can now redesign the world we want to live in. And I hope that if we are gonna redesign that world, that number one, that world isn't just a digital world. I would hate that we basically recreate that movie WALL-E, that Pixar movie WALL-E, where we're on pod just staring at screens all the time. That screens and digital worlds ultimately should be a gateway to the physical world. And there's a lot of studies basically on like things like loneliness. And what the research shows, for example, is social media, when it's a gateway to, hu to meeting people in the real world, is actually good for us, it makes us happier. But when it's a destination, it can often make us feel more isolated, like looking through the window of a dinner party. A lot of the things I've been thinking about with interfaces is how flat they've become. 
Flat design was this design that merged more than a decade ago. But we want dimension. We want to be able to experience things. So I think some of the big trends are the following. Number one, interface design is going to become more dimensional. And I think AI interfaces, we are not going to have a universal text-based interface. The ChatGPT interface, which is singular text-based, is not probably the right interface for every tool. When you open your iPhone, every app has a different interface. Can you imagine if your calculator, your compass, your email, your music player, every single application had to use the same interface? You don't want that. So you want a multimodal interface, and you want it to be dimensional. I think that this flat design has reached its logical conclusion. Next, I think interfaces need to be more emotional. I think that the more we spend in the digital world, the colder it can feel without emotion. I think people want to feel like the technology and the software understands them. So again, if you ask ChatGPT or Google question, and I ask ChatGPT or Google question, we get the same answer. And this is great if we ask, like, what's the capital of Italy or, like, what's the history of fiat? We probably should get the same answer. But let's say we ask, like, what should I do today? Or, like, who should I meet? Or what should I wear? Like, these questions where I'm feeling a certain way, I, I hope we don't get the same answer. And so the technology needs to learn and understand us. And the technology needs to bring us into and be a gateway to the physical world where we have that feeling that we should not underestimate how amazing the physical world was. Imagine the physical world didn't exist and somebody invented the physical world. We'd be like, oh my God, this is amazing. So maybe we just need to look at this world with fresh eyes. And maybe the last thing I'll just say is we need to imagine building software the way we build the environment. Imagine, would you want to live in a house designed the way a lot of people design software? Imagine you're in a house, and then every little room is independently designed. There's no holistic vision, and you can only move the furniture based on testing. You can do an A-B test, and somebody walks in, and if they sit down, uh, okay, we're going to move the chair. You want to have data, you, but you want to balance that with a cohesive vision, totally integrated. So the reason I say all this is the culture that I understand, the Italian culture, can bring many of what I believe to be the missing ingredients of software and of AI. I don't think we want purely technologists to build the future, because the last world wasn't just built by builders, it was built by everyone. No, I, I agree. <laughs> We all agree. <laughs> we all agree with, with, with that, Brian, and definitely it is encouraging uh, for Italy. And if we look at history, uh, we always are taken by the, the technology that is invented now. But if we go back yep. to fire, if we go back to the wheel, yeah. if we go back to combustion engine, electricity, more recently internet, and now AI, these have always been moments in which we have the opportunity of changing uh, what we do and how we do it. And I do feel that today the focus is more around how we can use these technologies to really do what we do in a more clever way, in a faster way, and that's good. Uh, I also feel that uh, it's very much technology-driven in yeah. the sense that there needs to be put a, a infrastructure that we need to learn in just understanding yeah. how best to use it. But on the other <coughs> hand, I, I do feel that what was interesting, when I was an engineering student here in Turin uh, more than 20 years ago, back then, what really was changing was internet and mobile phones. And what we would have imagined back then, and most of my uh, friends who, who were studying with me, they were very compelled to going in the telco industry and working for the mobile companies or going to, to work for the internet companies, and that was more infrastructure at that point. But it was very hard to really think about all the things that came out of it, and your company is a good example of it. And I feel that we're not spending enough time, as, yeah, as, as we speak about ju just trying to reflect on what can we do that we, were, we have never been able to do in history. What can we actually create that was never created? And I feel that if, if there is a push particularly to younger, young entrepreneurs like we have here today. It's really not to try and reason on the, finkel, on the simple things, not to reason on the ones that are actually easy, but really try and take this opportunity with this 
technology that's coming up to really reflect on what hasn't been done. And, and equally, going back to, to the point you were making about how it's important to really complement this technology and, and, and be able to have more the humanities uh, sides and skills come out, I, I do feel that as, as AI becomes a bigger part of, of how we live and, and operate, there's going to be a lot of uh, human sides that are going to be more valuable. Oh, yeah. And one of the things that I really would like to address, because we've been spending time on creativity and technology, is really emotions. And I think that one doesn't speak enough in, 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 in the business world, in the company world, in corporations about how emotions are important. And on one side, I feel that organizations are made of, of people, and, and the emotion side, particularly in a culture like ours, in Italy are, are really important, and, and that really drives motivation, it really drives what we want to do. But also in your relationship with whom, with whom you work for, ultimately your customers. And I feel that, for example, in Ferrari, you do have a very visceral part of what drives the emotion that exists from our Formula One fans, uh, a big emotion from our clients, and it's very much linked to good moments with their family. Uh, people have enjoyed Formula One because it's also linked to memories they've had with friends, memories they've had with, with, with their families, moments, and, and equally for the cars. And you've been doing a lot of uh, thinking around this theme, and, and I feel that we've probably spent too much time on creativity when emotions are also probably one of the biggest factors of your success as an entrepreneur and of your company. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> if you think of a company like a human body, it seems like a lot of companies, at least big companies, it's like they've cut their body off at the head, they're disembodied, they're disconnected from their heart, and they maybe cut themselves off on one side and they're really, really analytical. I remember somebody once told me, numbers are the language of business. And I thought to myself, that's the problem. In fact, numbers aren't, or at least should not be the language of business. Language should be the language of business. Ideas should be the language of business. But what ends up happening is that in the spirit of accountability, you know, companies have boards. Boards serve shareholders. Shareholders are primarily financially oriented in their language as numbers. And that language becomes the measurement system for which many things do. And so you basically have these companies where the board meetings and the executive team and the entire the entire communication is about things that can be measurable. Unfortunately, it turns out some of the most important things in our life tend to be difficult to measure, like emotions and feelings. Do people make decisions in their life primarily based on data or primarily based on emotions? I would say that maybe in a business context, they seem to make decisions on the data, but consumers, when they make important decisions, or if you think of the most important three or four decisions you made in your life, I bet you your emotions, your feelings, your intuition were perhaps the primary driver in those decisions. I think that we need not only more creativity in positions of leadership, but we need more intuition. We need to actually bring our entire like, hearts into businesses. You know, we, um, uh, you know, everything I do, I try to be open. I try to like, make sure the Airbnb as a company has a soul, has a spirit. Because if it doesn't, then, well, let me give you a story. During the pandemic, we lost 80% of our business in eight weeks. And there were, we were working on our IPO, and there were people, headlines, within eight weeks from our, working on our IPO, people saying, is this the end of Airbnb? Will Airbnb exist? And Two things happened right after that. The first is I remember getting a lot of text messages from like former employees that I never thought I'd ever hear from saying, we want Airbnb to exist and we're still pulling for you. And it felt like the world rallied behind the company because we wouldn't have existed had it not been for people's participation. And I started wondering, why did people have this feeling? 
it couldn't just be that we had spaces. It had to be that this company represented something deeper. And many of our very best acts have been in our most difficult motion, uh, moments. And in our most difficult moments, we don't always make decisions based on data. One of the most important decisions I ever made was when I made a decision in May of 2020 to reduce the size of Airbnb and we had to do a layoff. It was you know, obviously one of the most difficult decisions of my life. But we tried to do it with, and give everyone dignity. We tried to go above and beyond and really take care of people. A reasonable person could have said, we're trying to cut expenses, so why are you like, trying to give people a year of health care in the United States and give them like, really a like, generous severance? Why are you creating a recruiting outplace agency to help them find other jobs? Why are you creating an alumni directory? More importantly, in that letter, I said that I have a deep feeling of love for all of my employees. And I said to those leaving, I'm truly sorry. The world will never forget that what you brought to Airbnb, what made Airbnb. I want to thank you from the bottom of your heart to sharing it with us. What that did is I think, I hope, my communication, which was probably viewed by many as perhaps unnecessary, too open, that a lot of lawyers and HR people and other people at other companies who are real humans with real emotions maybe would round the edges off that person. And then suddenly in business, they no longer seem like a real person. At the, through that layoff, we um, had, I got hundreds of emails from people laid off with thank you letters of just like the dignity they had and how they were treated. And I think that everyone who stayed, they worked harder. They worked harder, not just for them, but for the people that had left. That I think ultimately data will get you so far, but your imagination, your intuition, your feelings, your care, they will get you all the way there. That's what's gonna keep people with you for years. That's what's gonna get people to work and climb up the mountaintop. That's what's gonna, I think, get people to stick with you, to buy your products. Technology alone is not enough. It's the creativity, it's the soul, and again, this is what Italy and the culture of Italy has to offer to um, Airbnb. And maybe the last thing I'll say, because you asked me a prior question about yeah. AI. Um, can I talk about that? Absolutely. Okay. So here's the thing. Think about the history, okay, history of computing. In the 1970s, you had basically the modern uh, computer, the microcomputer. It was very, very difficult to use. So only basically engineers used it. And then in the late 70s, early 80s, you had like the personal computer, like the Macintosh. Suddenly, you had this point and click device that millions of people could use, and they created the graphical user interface. And I remember we went from MS-DOS to actually a graphical user interface, and then you went from millions of people using a computer to hundreds of millions of people using a computer. And then in the 2000s, there was the mobile phone revolution, and that interface was even more intuitive to use. It was so intuitive to use even more than like putting in a CD and like getting a computer to work, that a two-year-old could pick up a device and know how to use it as could an 80-year-old. And because of that, its application widened further. And also, suddenly we went from millions to hundreds of millions to billions of devices. What AI could do is be the step change significantly more intuitive from a hobbyist computer to a point-and-click graphic user interface to a multi-touch phone that could do anything. Imagine something even more intuitive that more people could use that is completely immersive in our life. It could be used for so many more applications. We don't just have to imagine the world we have in AI. AI can create entire new worlds for us. It is the most powerful tool case um, that we've ever had. You know, every, uh, like, you know, we talk about everyone can have an AI assistant. That is a limited, that's an awesome but limited vision. We can do so much more for that. AI can help us design entire environments. There's a lot of worry about architects and artists getting replaced by AI. Another way to look at it is AI will allow this artist to have a surface area that Michelangelo could never have dreamed of and that you can design entire worlds now. AI could just be merely a personal assistant. And, and but I think, think about all the friends we have in our life. AI can help you be a gateway to all these connections, all these communities. And I think the key thing, maybe the last thing I'll just say is, it's so important 
that everyone participates in the future. If we want to live in a future that's amazing and creative and beautiful, everyone must participate. We cannot just have some people participating. And I also don't think the technologists want to do this alone. They want participation of all of society. And I would say now is the time for everyone to help build this new world. We will live in the future. And everyone here wants to live in the future. So I do, uh, I do think that it's really important to try and, and reflect in this moment yeah. and, and as we will act to build this future on, on possibilities that are opening themselves that we couldn't imagine. And I feel that there's a lot of decisions that if we were helped in, in thinking about them logically, we would make better decisions. Really? And, and, and that is something that hopefully we, we will have more tools and capabilities to help us. On the other side, our instinct, our intuition, just being able to have more courage in trusting it, being able to also make sure that, that we, we actually listen to our feelings is also something that will happen more. And, and that's what, if, if there was one, one aspect that I feel is, is underestimated, is how, how much we will also benefit from intrinsically human characteristics yes. we have. So all, all the things that can help us be more rational are, are going to make us better. But at the end of the day, what really makes us decide is, is our feelings. Who really has control in what we do as humans is our feelings. And so having, having the opportunity of reflecting of how we, we come to trusting them more and, and also make sure that we listen to them more seems to me really important. And just going back to companies and, and what Brian was saying, I, I, I had an advice some years ago about, uh, from an entrepreneur, which I thought was, made a lot of sense uh, then, but makes even more sense today, where he mentioned that what he feels uh, an entrepreneur does and, and what a company ought to do is do what you love with the people you love for the people who love what you do. And, and, and what's I the key word there? I think it's love. Exactly. And, and <laughs> I've said many of the same things. Build a company people love working for, making products that people love using. And the word love is so important. Our logo is like an inverted heart. I think that feeling is infused in everything we do. I think ultimately what people want more than anything is love. They want to feel it. And when you put your love into a product, people sense that care. When you put your love into a team and lead them, they will feel that and they will reciprocate. I cannot think of a better return on investment than love. It turns out to be hard to measure, but it's one of the things that's held us together through all of human history. And with AI and this technological revolution, maybe we could argue it's going to matter more than ever before. And, and, and I think if, if that's something we can convey today, I think that's really important. And I think the Italian culture, again, as an American, Italian-American, I would say that is my perception, that Italians are very in tune with this basic need that every single person on the planet has, something the world needs more of, that tech needs more of. And that's what you feel. That is the most fundamental feeling that I think somebody can have. And I think that's what you have to provide for the world. So we now have a couple of questions, because if not, we'll, we'll go long, yeah, yeah, <laughs> a long time it. speaking. And, uh, and I just wanted to be mindful. Here we are. Okay. So thank you. Uh, oh, I'm over there. So thank you, Brian and John. Let's make a round of applause for them. Thank you. To start, it was it was it, it was truly inspiring, uh, especially the part when you shared the the, the the pandemic phase. It was not easy, and and thank you for sharing that. Uh, mm, of course, this conference is for uh, making new business, and so we had a lot of founders that sent us some questions. We can, we yeah. can ask you both. Yeah. Uh, let's start from Brian. Um, 
the first one, how do you maintain, uh, you, you talked about this earlier maybe, you, how do you maintain your own identity and avoid becoming too tied to your business identity? Yes. <laughs> it's a funny question. I had the thought a little while ago, um, if I died, would they say Brian Chesky died or would they say, did you hear what happened? The Airbnb guy died. <laughs> And I'm pretty sure they'd say the second, a lot of people. So I am very tied to Airbnb. And I love that in many ways. I always thought of being a founder like being a parent and that the company is a child. But maybe the difference is that your identity is not so entwined with the child. The child eventually grows up and has their own identity. And weirdly, the bigger Airbnb gets, the more tied to my identity becomes not the less like a parent. And so I think that it's really important that while on the one hand you embrace that, that the com I say on the one hand you really want the company's identity to be in some ways connected to you. I think in, like now I do a lot of press interviews. I release the products. I try to make sure that everything of the company exudes my values. At the same time, I want to also let people know I am an ind a person, grandparents coming from Italy. My parents were social workers. Here's my story. Here's the journey I went on. I have friends. Many of my friends came from before Airbnb. Those roots are really important because if I'm not an entire person, if I'm just a servant of the company, then I'm probably not going to be happy. I'm not going to live as rich of a life. And also, I probably won't be as good of an entrepreneur. I'm going to get very, very much narrow-minded. So I've really struggled with that during the pandemic. I think those two worlds converged. I got really lonely, very isolated. I basically didn't leave my house for like a year because we were sheltering in place and I was like working 16 hours a day. On the good, the company turned around. It was unbelievable performance, but then we go public. We have like a hundred billion dollar valuation. I get to the top of the mountain and I realize I'm alone every day and I realize like I've built a company, but I haven't built a personal life. And that you have to be, in, if you're busy, you have to be intentional doing that because every hour could be filled with your business. And one day you wake up and that's your entire world. And so that's something that I've spent the last couple years doing, reclaiming old relationships, friends, and just really spending time. And honestly, it hasn't, not only has it made me happier, it's made me a better entrepreneur. Which is why finally you came to Italy. Finally, <laughs> I came to Italy. I was like, I'm too busy. And then I finally did. <laughs> Okay, so cheers for that balance. Uh, um, let's talk about balance on technology side. Uh, you mentioned the, the big shifts that are happening yeah. these days. Uh, John, you've been in, in business for you and, but, and, but and maybe I, I just wanted to ca carry on on uh, the identity, personal and mm -hmm. company identity, because I have three, three different experiences on that. One is a company like Ferrari, who has a very strong identity linked to its founder. And in a company like Ferrari, what's really important is to make sure that the identity of the founder is, is very alive. And that's something that we've, we've been doing a lot in, in the recent years. And also make sure that that identity of the founder is in tune with today. Stellantis, which is a very young company, it has only two years and a half, but it has very long roots. It's, it's over three centuries and with many different identities. So there the challenge is how can you make sure you create a new identity and, and an identity which is respectful of all the different identities. So that's somehow is, is a bigger ch challenge, but a very interesting challenge because it really makes, makes this company a, a very diverse uh, companies in, in, in every way, which it, with its brands, with its presence and geographies. And then lastly, I, I, I have, we just founded a company of which I'm a proud founder, which is Lingotto this year. And, and when you reflect as a founder how Brian was expressing it, you, you also want to make sure that what you're really trying to do is define a set of parameters and values of, of people who want to work, uh, who want to work in the company and with you. And, and the last point, which, which I think is really relevant, and Brian spends time on it, is, is how, do you, how do you make sure that the company <coughs> goes beyond you 
and, and how do you make sure that you have very strong people around? And if, if you look at governance where, where decisions are made, the board, and you look at the board of Airbnb or our companies, we, we try and have very strong people there. And if you look at the management teams, very strong people, because ultimately that is what carries forward and, and makes sure that you as an individual contributor are part, are part of, a, of a larger team. Thank you. W one other question we have uh, is linked to, to that part in some, in some, uh, somehow. Um, you mentioned how, uh, I mean, the big legacy the, the comp these companies have, and uh, one of the uh, founders ask, uh, is asking you, how do you balance the need for growth and innovation with this, the responsibility of maintaining the company core values? I, I, I feel that um, th there, is, there is two ways to reflect. One is you do have growth through acquisition. And arguably, you could say that that's a very effective way of growing if you are able to, to be a good acquirer. And, and if you look at Stellantis, it, it really has been a succession <coughs> of companies that have come together. On the other hand, if you do have a wide space in front of you and you can grow organically and you are able to innovate to create growth, th that's an equally good path. It really depends on, on what is in front of you and how you build the future. What has been interesting, uh, and I really want to thank uh, the island the Vento team uh, that have helped us here in Italy being part of new companies, so 21st century companies, and, and really being, being with younger people who are now in their 20s, and, and, and really seeing how they think uh, about the, the basis of their company based on that specific innovation, which is somehow different from my personal experience, which is really in companies that already have, have history. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm jumping, to, um, uh, Brian. So um, another question. How did you handle the relationship with hotels starting from the, from the beginning? Did you set Airbnb as an enemy or as a completely different travel experience? <coughs> we try not to be an enemy. <laughs> um, when we started Airbnb, I always thought it was a completely different idea. I mean, first of all, we started Airbnb in 2007, that one weekend, because the design conference was coming to San Francisco, the hotels were sold out, people couldn't afford to stay in San Francisco, and we thought, what if we created a bed and breakfast for this design conference? I didn't have any beds, but we pulled the beds out of the closet, um, three air beds out of the closet, and we called it airbedandbreakfast.com, and of course, that's where Airbnb comes from. It started with air beds. How could a company inflating air mattresses have become the enemy of a hotel? Airbnb was always founded to be, I think, a little different than a hotel. Nearly half of our business is more than a week. Most people don't stay in hotels for a week. Um, many, about a, third, a fifth of our business is longer than a month. Airbnbs are often booked by families in groups that couldn't have even stayed in a hotel. They want to cook, they want to be around a table. Many people book Airbnbs because they want to feel not like outsiders in a city staying in a major district, but they want to feel like it's like they're staying with a friend in another town. They want to feel like a local. And Airbnbs are cities all over the world. So what I would say is this. In 1950, there were 25 million people around the world that crossed the border to travel. And before the pandemic, that number was one billion. Travel is one of the fastest growing industries in the world. Hotels, no matter how fast they grow, can't keep up the capacity. I think travel, talking about emotion, is emotional. Mm -hmm. People love travel. We dream of travel. When we graduate, we travel. When we retire, we travel. When we get married, we travel. And if you ask people if you had all the money in the world, what would you do? Many people would say they would travel. So this is an industry that is so large that I've always believed that for us to win, nobody else had to lose, let alone hotels, that they have their use case, that we have our use case, that we can coexist. And my evidence of that is Airbnb. We now 
um, for every $1,500 spent in the world, $1 spent on Airbnb. It's come out of kind of nowhere over the last 15 years, and yet profits and revenue in hotels are significantly larger than when we started. I think it's growing the pie. There is some overlap, but ultimately, I do not think we need to think of enemies. Enemies are people that are competing for something that's zero sum that's not growing. And in a world like today, with imagination, we can imagine a world where there is so much white space that there is enough for both of us to grow, and probably neither of us can scale for the need and the desire for great experience people want to have all over the world. And, and, and I think, just to complement that, one of the things which I found Airbnb to be very clever at is managing the unintended consequences. Because often, what, what you end up seeing is that one, one is trying something which never has happened. And then, of course, problems derive from that, which you could not have thought through as you were imagining. But, but some companies will fight that and, and will feel that th there's resentment in, in, in the people who complain. Other companies will actually act on it, try and understand, yeah, open a dialogue. And if I were to say uh, one, of the, one of the things that is underestimated by how our Airbnb has actually acted uh, it is really that. And disruption has a negative connotation, going back to this hotel fight, which on the contrary, Airbnb has proven factually that, that it has been acting differently by just making different proposals, looking at uh, travel in a different way. And, and, and Brian also, as a leader, has been out there and, and being open to dialogue, speaking with people who don't necessarily think, think the same. So yeah, I remember that. Credit for I that, remember I, when uh, early on, I used to think if people hate you, you should avoid them. And then I hired somebody, uh, one of my first executives, and she said, if people don't like you, you should meet with them face to face. And I said, why would I do that? And they said, because it's hard to hate people up close. <clears throat> and the reality is that that's true. That the more you spend time with people, the more you find common ground. That the other is not so other. People are basically good. We're basically 99.9% .9 the same. That we spend a lot of time talking about how different we are. And ultimately, to your point, if you are in the audience building a company and you are so successful, you will succeed in building something that you did not intend fully. Because you can't build a tool, put it in millions of people's hands, and they use it exactly how you anticipated. Society cannot change in some kind of way without you anticipating it. And when it does happen, there's gonna be some great things. And there's gonna be some things people don't like. And when that happens, you're gonna get criticism. When you get criticism, you have two choices. To defend yourself, because you feel like you're being attacked, or you could listen and say, is this fair criticism? What can we do? And I, the instinct is to defend yourself. The problem is then you'll spend the rest of your life defending yourself and sometimes they might be right and you had an opportunity to use that criticism to make yourself better and you haven't. And so every time I've tried to ask myself when this criticism, is it true? How do we adapt? And if, it, if people are concerned, about like taxes, we collect room at hotel taxes, now of $5 billion globally, I think, in our history. People are concerned about the impact on neighborhoods. We built this AI reservation screening technology to try to screen for parties. People are concerned about the impact of neighborhoods, so we worked with cities to build registration systems to figure out how many days people can rent. There's always a solution. If people come together, they can see each other eye to eye with creativity, with problem solving, we can always design something that works for everyone. In other words, we can have win-wins in the world, and that's what design and technology can do. I think we have, uh, I think we have one last question. Of course, the questions come from- Let's do two. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna find- We don't have Brian in Some Italy. more than two, probably. Uh, but uh, w the founders, uh, are starting new business, so they are very curious and, and eager to, to, to listen from you and, and what, you, what you see as, as leaders. Uh, can you sh uh, John, can you share uh, some insight in, into your approach to managing so many different uh, uh, industries, right? And uh, uh, how do you keep up to date on, on, on so many uh, industries that are very diverse? So I, I actually, m most of my professional time has been spent uh, with Stellantis and, and Ferrari. 
Mm -hmm. So within, within the car industry now becoming mobility industry and uh, travel is about emotions. So <laughs> it, it's about trying to really see in, in, this, in this decade of, of large changes, both regulatory uh, moving from uh, combustion technologies to electrified technologies, also having a, a hardware product which requires different capabilities, uh, more like an electronics goods product. Uh, the services and, and the software that enable those services that you can have within, within a car, now also defined as mobility devices. So that, that is uh, v very much where I've been spending a lot of time. I started early, so I'm now in my third decade of, of, of being in, in, in it. Um, my other responsibility as CEO of XOR, which effectively has uh, many interests, is really uh, supported by, by great colleagues I have. And, and uh, on the venture side, Noam, who's here. Uh, I know Suzanne's here, who's COO of XOR. So d the overall team, and it's a small team, and I think being a small team is really important because it avoids any kind of bureaucracy, which ultimately are a big, big uh, sucker of time. It, and and, and they, they are really much, much in, in uh, present with our different companies. On the other hand, we do have a very strong sense of purpose at XOR, which is uh, building great companies. And so that is a belief we have. That is what we do. That is what we we, we love doing, and, and it's with, with great people. And, and so there is a le an, an important element, which is the, the people element, and, and, and also having clarity about how, how we do find affinities and, and who we work well with and, and who um, we don't work well with. And the way in which you can try and look at the, the very diverse universe that XOR is and try and look at it, where are the com commonalities, they, they really are uh, linked to building great companies, which is a purpose, and, and our values, which is very much a common, uh, a, a common language that, that we have with whom we work. And, and so it's, it's a long explanation, but so far it has worked. And one of the things I, I do uh, I do spend a lot of time thinking is as we do grow and as we do develop from companies like the one that, that we are investing and, and, and there are some here today, here in Italy, Vento, to larger companies like, like Ferrari, is, is how can we also try and, and, and help and stimulate uh, what we're doing at Ferrari with what we're doing in, uh, in smaller companies. And Benedetto, the CEO of Ferrari, is here. And, and he spends uh, also a lot of time with, with younger companies. And I think that exchange is, is a really important one. Time and, uh, and team uh, are, are key aspects. One uh, uh, last question for Brian. Uh, you talked about, I mean, how personal can, can be your role. And one of the founders here is asking you, do you think it's important to show uh, vulnerabilities as a founder? And if yes, who did you share these vulnerabilities with? We go back to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think people should, I think you should show vulnerability. I think people are, I understand why it would not seem like a good idea. Because if you're vulnerable, you could expose yourself. And you could remove the armor, and people could, you know, they could see weaknesses. And then you're expressing areas of weakness, and you're worried that those will make you not seem strong. And if you not seem strong, then people may not want to follow you as a leader. But I think that that, then ask yourself, well, how would you feel? if you were led by somebody and they expressed vulnerability about who they were. I think that people, they follow, 
you as a founder, you're going to have a vision. But I think as much as people follow a vision, they follow people. They follow people. And as a leader, you'll say, like, we're trying to go up here. This is the mountain we're trying to climb. And people are really excited to climb that mountain. But every single day, what they're following isn't a mountaintop. They're following a person. And I think they want to feel like that person is a real person that has feelings. Because if, they're, if you're vulnerable, they can be vulnerable. And if you express how you feel, then they can see where you're coming from. They understand the intent. They understand how much you care. And that's going to, if you're vulnerable, you put your heart into the organization, then I think you're going to get that back. And what I always did is I started, I was really lucky because I had two co-founders that I could be vulnerable with. I could share my challenges. I could get advice from them. And then I had a board that I could feel vulnerable with, employees. And I think that as I, as I was able to open up more, I felt less lonely, less isolated. It can be extremely lonely if you're leading and you don't share how you're feeling. You can't express your words. And I always thought when I started Airbnb that I would have a lot more friends and feel a lot less lonely. And the thing is that the more successful you get, the more a bubble might emerge, the more isolated you get. So how do you push against that? The way you can push against that is vulnerability, to be open, to not become robotic. And those are the kind of leaders that I think are going to be most successful. So I think there's maybe a point where you don't want to share everything. There are some things you should hold to yourself. People also want to work for people that are courageous and have a business, but people want to work for leaders with hearts. And the vulnerability is how your heart is demonstrated. Thank you. This was, you want to add something? I, I wanted to thank, thank you, thank you, and grazie a tutti voi. Thank you. Thank you, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you, Roman. Thank you for, for this truly Thank nice you. conversation. Uh, we did talk about culture. We did talk, talk about AI, of course. Uh, but there's more later. So uh, this is lunchtime. We'll be back at 2.30. Thank you.